Movies that focus on morality and religion is not something that is uncommon in the horror genre. I mean, there are 50 different demon possession movies and I'm sure 50 more are being made as I speak. Even though I like these types of films, they usually say nothing or push the boundaries on these themes. You just see them touch something, get possessed, the priest comes and saves the day, the family lives happily ever after, and then psych, something is still brewing. After watching the new film, Bird Box Barcelona, I'm not gonna lie. I thought the film was a little boring, but it did remind me of the film Death by Temptation. The funny thing is, I was going to talk about this film a few years ago on my channel, but I ended up deciding to go with the people under the stairs. If you haven't seen that video on my channel, please check it out. Thanks. Both Bird Box Barcelona and Death by Temptation had heavy themes based on religion, but they both took different approaches. I think I also enjoyed Temptation more because it had Dwayne Cleophus Wayne in it and growing up I had such a huge crush on this character. Kinda still do. Don't judge me. Premiering in 1990, Death by Temptation was written, produced, directed, and starred James Bond III. It also stars Kadeem Hardison, Cynthia Bond, Bill Nunn, and Samuel L. Jackson. Being produced by a film company called Troma Entertainment, they're known for producing independent B-horror movies that are sort of campy and gory. This film absolutely falls in this category with its dramatic lighting, ludicrous special effects, and some of the worst fake blood I've ever seen. But it's still a good movie. I also want to note that I absolutely do not agree with this movie's ideologies on what makes someone a sinner while others are not. I don't believe that the only people who are morally good are the religious ones while the others are not. Opening up the movie with a bartender talking on the phone to numerous women, the movie's theme is made clear. While talking to the first woman, the bartender attempts to persuade her to get an abortion. Just dump the kid and we can kick it again, all right? He then calls a second woman and tells her that he wants to role play in her husband's clothes next time they get together. This idea is going to be repeated throughout the rest of the film. Men whose morals can be easily questioned. This man, the bartender, becomes the first victim of the temptress who is the antagonist of the entire film. With little effort, the bartender agrees to go over to her house and, well, mm, the rest is history. The movie cuts to Joel, who is the main character. We start his story off with a dream showing a young Joel watching his father preach in church. While he's preaching, a lady in black is seen lurking behind him in the pews. This mysterious woman we'll see throughout the movie is the personification of temptation. She's the temptress. I do want to acknowledge that some believe the temptress represents the three-letter virus, but that's not what I got from the film. Maybe that was the filmmaker's intention, but I couldn't find any concrete evidence to back that up. While she's lurking, his father preaches about temptation, and he can't seem to take his eyes off of her. She soon starts touching Joel, and this is when his father decides to send him to live with his grandma for a while. On their way to her house, his father sees the temptress standing in the street and attempts to run her over, but fails when the wife grabs the wheel and crashes the car. Embedding herself into one of his worst memories helps to create doubt on his life path as a minister. She also does this with one of his happiest memories. Him watching his father preach and getting inspiration from that moment taints his memories, which in turn makes him doubt his life path. When Joel wakes up from his nightmare, his grandma attempts to comfort him about his parents' death and his future. He then has another dream about temptation and realizes that he needs a break from ministry. In this dream, temptation leaves a rose in his father's casket and exits out of the church. It's like she's leaving because she served her purpose and now she's moving on to the next. He then calls his friend Kay, who was raised similarly but left North Carolina for New York to pursue an acting career. Joel tells him he needs a break and decides to go and visit Kay in New York. The next night, the temptress is back at the same bar when a married man approaches her. He tries to lie about his name, but she's quick to call him out. Somehow she knows his real name. I'm assuming maybe she has the power to read people's minds or just knows the truth. Because he is so eager to impress her, she quickly asks him to go back to her place. While they're doing their thing, the temptress first uses a feather for foreplay before she pulls out a whole knife. When he sees the knife, she tells him not to move and he doesn't. I'm not sure why he complies. Maybe he thought she was going to unalive him or because that's possibly another power she might have. 
If he thought she was going to unalive him, he wouldn't have slept over, so I'm just going to assume that it's part of her powers. She starts to draw blood before the movie cuts to the next scene. When Norman wakes up the next day, he has scratches all over his back and neck. And no, I'm not talking about the normal kind. His scratches look like he survived the same bear attack that Leo did in The Revenant. When he questions her, she tells him that the scratches aren't even the worst part. What the hell's wrong with you? Honey, I've given you something there's no cure for. <laughs> he gets upset when he realizes that he's going to lose everything. The temptress goes back to the same bar where she meets her next victim, who is a queer man. Before she gets him, he rejects a guy attempting to hit on him. He makes it clear that he wants to be left alone. While she's chilling at the bar, the guy decides to stand next to her. It seems like she has this sixth sense power because she questions if he even wants to be standing next to her. She clearly knows where his true desires lie. Later in the film, he comes over uninvited and this clearly upsets her because she didn't invite him. She only likes it when she has control. They start to get intimate, but it's clear that Jonathan's not into it. She then backdoors him and he starts to enjoy it. This confirms that she can only unalive someone when they're enjoying the moment. When they're giving in to their temptation, she's able to take them. When Kay walks in the bar, Temptress sets her sight on him. He walks over to her and as they talk, she touches him. Her touch gives him romantic visions of them dancing and kissing. When she invites him over, he has to decline because his friend Joel is arriving. The next day when Kay and Joel are talking, Kay explains how he met a woman who is sweet, polite, and attractive. But when they walk into the bar, Temptress sets her sight on Joel. She pretends that she doesn't remember Kay, and this of course confuses and upsets him. I'm sorry, I don't believe we've met before. In fact, I'm sure of it, but it's so nice to meet Now that she has Joel, she doesn't need Kay anymore. She got Kay to bring Joel to the bar, so he served his purpose. When the temptress comes over, Kay notices that she doesn't have a reflection. He runs to the bar and tells a guy named Dougie, who throughout the first half of the film is seen hitting on different women each night, that the temptress doesn't have a reflection. Dougie reveals that he's actually a police officer who focuses on supernatural cases. A year ago, he was assigned to a case where a man claimed that he slept with the devil. He felt snakes in his stomach before they came out of his mouth. Tracing the man's steps led Dougie back to the bar. Kay and Dougie decide to go and speak to a psychic to get answers. The psychic explains that the temptress is everything negative and attacks any good conscience a man has. She continues to say that the temptress uses her sexuality to lure and hold morality hostage to subdue their conscious and subconscious. She preys on the weak-minded and unalives them so that she can imitate that person and use it for her next victim. Which is interesting because I feel like I didn't see that in her character. Like I didn't see the shift from her being one person to the other after she killed him, but I do find that interesting. They're also told that the temptress' greatest victory would be the destruction of a truly innocent person like Joel. He's the last person in his family line who could teach the world what is right. We also find out that this whole time, she was luring Joel to the city. It was her in his dreams. They're also told that the only way Temptress can be destroyed is by someone who can resist her due to their faith. During this scene, the filmmaker's goal and theme of the film is summed up. The Temptress represents the temptation to sin. Each victim also represents someone who is morally corrupt. The first man is a womanizer who pushes a woman to terminate their situation. When it comes to the second victim, because he cheated on his wife, his punishment is that he contracted a virus that was deadly at the time. Because he fell into his temptation, his punishment is his health and life being compromised. I do want to note that I think they're trying to bring awareness to the virus, but the way they did it was wrong. Showing it this way feels like it's telling viewers that people who contracted the virus got sick because they were sinning. There are plenty of people who contracted it by being with their partner, blood transfusions, or sleeping with someone that they trust. This approach didn't have any nuance, which I think would have elevated the theme. The last victim, Jonathan, was shown to be queer and that alone was his sin. I wholeheartedly disagree with this and believe loving who you love and being attracted to whoever you're naturally attracted to will never be a sin. Him including these stories for each victim shows exactly who the creator thinks is and isn't a sinner. While Joel and Temptress are having lunch, she brings up him wanting to be a world-renowned minister. 
He realizes that he never told her about his aspirations, but she explains it away. You just seem to have that aura about you. Plus your mannerisms tend to give it away, I know, because, well, let's just say that I've met a few ministers in my travels. When the temptress touches him, she starts to feel unwell because of his faith. She then kisses him, which for some reason doesn't affect her, but touching his hand does. The grandma starts to receive messages in her nightmares too, and she sees all of the temptress's victims, including the married man, who we come to find out gave his wife the virus and she shot him as a result. When Kay tries to tell him that he thinks something is wrong with the temptress, he accuses Kay of being jealous and dismisses his claims because Kay's been drinking. Kay continues pleading with him, but Joel isn't listening. He tells Joel to go back to North Carolina, but Joel explains that he's not a child and that he can make his own decisions. Dougie and Kay decide to fight back and come up with a plan. They tell the bartender to put holy water in her drink and their plan initially works. They attempt to unalive her, but she uses her telekinetic powers to stop them. They decide to run in opposite directions and Dougie quickly gets taken out by the new bartender and the temptress. Kay makes it back home, and as he's grabbing a 40, he hears something playing on the TV. Kay having a drinking problem is him falling for the temptation and getting taken over by it. I feel like his sin was an afterthought because it was never indicated from the beginning that he had an addiction. This is once again the creator's view on drinking being a sin. Kay wasn't an alcoholic, but him drinking even a little bit made him a sinner. On the TV, Kay is playing with guns and talking to himself through the screen. As he gets closer, he gets grabbed and sucked into the TV. Joel, like a dummy, runs and tells Temptress everything that just conspired. They start kissing and it gets more and more intense until Joel stops it. Because he continues rejecting her, she poisons him with a kiss. While knocked out, he has a nightmare about falling into sin and sleeping with Temptress, but that nightmare is quickly interrupted when Grandma walks in and attempts to save Joel. Joel gathers the strength to pick up a cross, and she quickly and easily becomes unalived by him shouting, Demon, I rebuke you. Temptress is finally destroyed, and he and his grandma are reunited. The film ends with Kay being a demon chauffeur, and now Dougie is an incubus just like Temptress. Death by Temptation by no means is a perfect movie. Her powers were inconsistent, the protagonist was boring, and the messages didn't have any nuance. But I love that the creator tried to say something, especially back then when horror movies with a message were a rarity. If the film was remade, I think it would have way more nuance. Like maybe Joel's morality was not as perfect as he portrayed himself to be. Or when the temptress assumed that someone was a sinner, once she spent time with them, she realized they're actually a good person. I think one thing that could have perfected this movie is that if it showed that people are complex and not so black and white. Lastly, I want to say Cynthia Bond, the director's wife, played the hell out of her role because she was so creepy. I want to say thank you so much for watching my video and I can't wait to hear what you think. Bye. What, you met someone without my help? You met someone because it gets even better. Okay. She's pretty. She's, she's pretty. She's probably blind. But that's cool. No, I, 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 I think I'd approve it. Hey.